So one of the things that amateurs do is space. Uh, it's quite common for amateurs to have small portable radios that won't work uh, well over urban distances with buildings in the way, so we put repeaters on the tops of tall buildings. Well, a satellite's just like a really, really, really tall building. And so right from the beginning of the space age, as early as December 1961, amateurs have been putting repeaters into orbit. It happens that they, amongst a bunch of communication engineers working uh, for NASA in the early 60s, were a bunch of hams. <laughs> so you need payload, you need ballast for this particular payload, so when you launch a rocket, it's got to be spin symmetric, otherwise the thing will fail to launch correctly. So there's, there's the payload, and there's often ballast to get the thing to balance correctly, so that the rocket will maintain a, a steady path. And so they're like, huh, you need ballast, and we would like to put a repeater in orbit. And so really, right at the beginning of the space age, you had amateurs doing this. So there are still about, well, today there are about 15 amateur satellites in orbit, well, satellites that carry amateur traffic. Uh, some have another function, like the International Space Station, for example, has human beings inside. But <laughs> it has an amateur repeater on board, uh, an amateur uh, sort of email system, and also an amateur station. So if you have the right gear, uh, you can, in principle, talk to astronauts on board the ISS. Uh, the difficulty here is they all work London time, so you've got to be willing to do it at very odd hours of the morning, and I haven't yet succeeded. So to, to deal with all the current amateur satellites, they're all in low Earth orbit, they will cross the sky from horizon to horizon quite quickly. If you're accustomed to seeing a TV antenna on the side of the building, not in Singapore, uh, the satellite is pointing at a fixed direction. That's pointing at a satellite 36,000 kilometers away almost four times the diameter of the Earth. So the Earth satellite, a very long way away. Much cheaper satellites orbit lower. And all the amateur satellites are as cheap as possible, and so they orbit quite low. The problem with that is that it's moving. And so, yes, at Geek Camp last year, it was Adrian and myself, uh, initially I was just holding the antenna and operating the radio at the same time, which was exhausting. So at some point, Adrian took over pointing the antenna so I could operate the radio. Again, because the, the satellite is moving so quickly, uh, about 20,000 kilometers per hour is its effective ground speed. Doppler effect actually changes the, measurably changes the, the frequency of the radio signals. So you're having to adjust the radio continually as the satellites cross the sky. So I thought, okay, that's really much too difficult. Uh, the obvious and simple solution to this problem is to build a device which will take care of the pointing, which is that thing there. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> it's, that actually works. So the deal is, really four things that you've got to worry about, at least four things with a satellite. Uh, one is that they are crossing the sky, so you've got a point. One is that the, the frequency is shifting with Doppler shifts, so you've got to keep adjusting the radio. And one is, again, amateur satellites are cheap, so they don't have attitude control. They just tumble through space. And so the antenna's orientation changes continuously and unpredictably. So in addition to pointing, I was also twisting so they do. It was twisting to keep it uh, correctly aligned with the satellite. So when you make a machine to do it, that third one's a bit difficult. And it's actually cheaper and simpler to just add a second antenna at right angles. And there's a bit one more trick which I'll get to to make that work. But that's why it's two sets of antennas. The antennas are also at, at two frequencies uh, to keep the receiver and transmitter from interfering with each other. Usually on the ground with ground birth repeaters, you have things called cavities, which are big brass tubes. On a satellite, weight is everything. And so it's actually cheaper and simpler to have the receiver at a lower frequency and the transmitter at a higher frequency so they can't interfere with each other. The, transmitters, the transmitter won't cause the receiving antenna to resonate. And therefore, it's much easier to keep the receiver and transmitter uh, from interfering with each other by having the two radios at two different bands and also the antennas at right angle. And so that's why the two different uh, sizes of elements on the antenna. So the design I chose was produced by a guy who does clever work for NASA's uh, classroom access program. So this is a, a program to make it easier for uh, K-12 students to get access to space-related stuff in different ways, and in particular to communicate with satellites. And so I thought, okay, I'll try his design. It's a fairly, well, it's a non-3D printing-based design, which turns out to matter. I've forgotten all the metalworking I learned in high school. Um, so I took, his design uses mostly robotics parts, and as you can see, they're pre-machined. So you're buying standard parts and putting them together. Give or take things like the cut uh, around the plastic tube in the middle. It's a sort of really rough cut. That's my extremely clumsy middle work. 
Um, this, this took about 10 or 12 iterations of cut, assemble, examine, dismantle, cut a bit more, assemble, examine, nope, nope, missed that, okay, dismantle, do it again and again and again until I got it to the point where all the moving parts uh, work together correctly. Uh, what you're seeing is on its side, uh, the two metallic cylinders are the motors. So the thing to the right is actually the, the, the azimuth motor, the motor that turns that way. It's inside the box on top of the, the, the stand. The motor at the top is the zenith or elevation motor, which turns that way to point between the antenna and overhead. That's on the left on the assembled machine. Uh, what you can probably see is it's a green board. Uh, they're actually a printed circuit board. So this is an interesting way to attach a, a potentiometer to be a sensor. To make a, to make a very simple servo, you have a DC motor with a reduction gear and a potentiometer. Instead of using steppers and then having to know where the thing is with limit switches. So it's just, it, it works. Um, and the plastic gears are only for uh, positioning the pots. They're not load bearing. The load bearing stuff is all metallic. So this is, this is from Servo City, which is a robotics part supply in the US. And the, the parts are designed for industrial and, and other robots. Um, one other thing on that picture. No, no. The, the white pipe is where you attach the antenna. There was a problem. This was the design for a single antenna. And so he, he up, the guy who designed this thing updated it later for two antennas. And so you'll notice that the, the elevation mode is at one end and the, uh, the thing for attaching the antenna is this bit of white pipe sticking out the side. In the updated uh, version, there's actually two metal pipes and the elevation mode has been moved out to one side. So I was working through this and you can see how the, the, the two green arrows there, handmade quarter inch to one inch spaces with set screws inside tubing. Not even mentioned in the text. <laughs> like, I, I don't even know what that means, let alone have the technical skills or parts to make such a thing. So I thought, right, that's, that's kind of a showstopper. Really need the two antennas, otherwise the, the fading is horrible. Well, you, if you've only got one antenna and you can't twist it, which in the single antenna case you can't, half the time you can't communicate with the satellite. So I looked around hackerspace and I had some uh, PVC pipe. And so <laughs> that's why it looks like that. It's a bit rickety. Uh, if I afterwards I'll operate it and you'll see it. It does do what it's supposed to do, but it kind of wobbles around a bit. It's, if it's out by a few degrees, it doesn't matter. But it's a, this is quite a, a nice, nice sort of tight assembly of robotics parts. So this is uh, <coughs> hastily assembled PVC pipe. Uh, the fully assembled set uh, looks like that, uh, which is more or less what you can see over there. Um, I'll call out. I shall come back to the details later. Uh, the, the key thing I suspect I'd suggest at this point is the, the means of control is a USB cable. And again, there was a change in the design which led to a rather strange and water which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, the fabrication was, for me, a bit of a learning exercise. I've never done surface mount soldering before. And so there's a bunch of resistors and capacitors there that are surface mount. Everything else is through hole, but the resistors and capacitors are these tiny little one millimeter by one and a half millimeter devices. So uh, I ordered from Element 14, uh, you can see two syringes there. On the left is a grey one which contains the solder paste, which it turns out you're supposed to use an air compressor to deliver, not use a hand. It's really, really, really hard to get the solder out at all. You're pressing away <laughs> to the point where hands are hurting to get the pellets of solder out. Um, and on the right, another syringe containing the tack flux. So this is flux as the flux built into solder, but it's also sticky. And so it's useful to put a bit down to sort of cause the component to stick where you want it to stick while before the solar melts. Once it melts, there's enough surface tension to get the component to sort of jump into the right position and then, and then the, the solar will set again. But until then, there's a risk of it moving around, especially because for the small number of components, I decided to use a hot air gun instead of an oven. Uh, the other reason was we didn't have an oven. Uh, so <laughs> friend lent me the hot air gun, which is the thing on the right. And so yeah, the little tube you hold, which blows air at upwards of 300 degrees Celsius. And so keeping all the components in place with the tack flux and pointing the air the right way, it was an interesting exercise. Uh, the roll of cap on tape near the back. Uh, if you put one component in place and now you want to do another one, it's like, ah, it, the stream of hot air is such that it will actually remelt the solder and push the component away. And so the cap on tape is actually enough to stop that from happening. And, and yes, I'm pleased to say, developed during the Apollo program for space use. More for uh, near zero Kelvin use, but it also has interesting properties for soldering. 
Um, the tax flux has dire warnings on it about the, it being an irritant, which is why the, the duct and the, the fan. Nonetheless, I got a whiff of the stuff up my nose, in my eyes, and I was like, oh, it is really, really unpleasant. Like, sort of liniment, but much stronger and, and just nasty, nasty stuff. Not toxic, not hugely dangerous, but really, really irritating. So, uh, things to be aware of. If you, if you see this stuff, like a tube that says in big letters, read MSDS, the Material Safety Data Sheet, first, <coughs> and follow the instructions. <laughs> Uh, the more sensible approach is indeed to use an oven, and the cheap way is to take an ordinary off-the-shelf toaster oven, in fact we now have one at Hackerspace earmarked for this purpose, and build a microcontroller. Um, Don't use it for bread. Yeah, yeah no longer food state. It's not appropriate for food, but put a, a, a thermal probe, a te temperature sensor inside the, the oven, use a silicon control rectifier to switch the thing on and off, and then there's firmware available that can be fed the temperature profiles for different solders. Different solders have different optimum uh, peak temperatures, rates of heating, rates of cooling, and the amount of time they're held at, at heat. So you'll say, yes, okay, I'm using that solder. Here's the profile. Give it to the controller, and it'll do the exact thing that that solder is designed to have done to it. So th this is, for 12 components, doing it by hand was, was fine. But for a larger number, and at some point I will do this at Hackerspace. Uh, the radio end of this is interesting. So there are two different tricks here. This is very much amateur radio tricks. Use of quarter wavelength sections of coax. So um, the, one of the problems I mentioned was the, to solve the twisting problem is to have two antennas at right angles to each other. That's not quite enough. You need them offset by quarter wavelength. So you can either physically offset them, which makes the, the mechanical design much harder, or you can insert a quarter wavelength difference in the feed line. So the, the signal from or to the radio, I'll get to the loop in a moment, but you can see that the two end pieces are about the same length, they go to the antennas, and there's a bit of cable in the middle. That is exactly one quarter wavelength at the speed at which uh, uh, a radio signal propagates inside this piece of coax, which is not quite the same as the speed of light in a vacuum, but similar. And so it means that uh, whatever is put into the, ante the antennas or received from the antennas from one is a quarter wavelength behind the other. And what that does is creates, they call it circular polarization, but it's more accurately a sort of helical, it's like a helix in space. So instead of being that way or that way, it's that. And the important property that has is that will resonate with an antenna at any orientation except pointing at you. But, but one position, there's nothing we can do, so then the signal's all going away from the Earth. But in every other orientation, a helical, polarized signal will, will resonate. And as I said, amateur satellites are cheap, so they don't have added, good attitude control or any attitude control. And so the two antennas plus the, the quarter wavelength delay solves that problem. Two separate harnesses, this, this is the 70 centimeter one, but there's also another one with a bigger loop, for the, or bigger pieces for the two meter. The other piece is the loop. And here, you have more amateur tricks. So connect two 50 ohm antennas in parallel, and you now have a 25 ohm load which does not correctly match the radio, which expects 50 ohms. So how do you transform 25 ohms to 50 ohms? Well, you can make filters and stuff with transformers, or you can go, huh, special trick with transmission lines. Um, if you have, assuming everything else is correctly balanced, the, if you have a 25 ohm feed, 50 ohm feed, and a bit in the middle, that's the square root of the product of the two at the outside, the, the geometric average, then it will actually transform one to the other. So what you need to get from 25 ohm back to 50 ohm is a piece of 37 and a half ohm coax. Well, you can't get 37 and a half ohm coax, but you can get 75. So the loop is actually two bits of quarter wavelength 75 ohm coax in parallel to make a single piece of quarter wavelength 37 and a half ohm coax, which transforms 25 ohms to 50 ohms. So how to do dirt cheap and very lightweight, uh, both the, the circular or helical polarization and the, the transformation to get from two parallel antennas back to what the radio expects with just bits of coax. There are other tricks that can be done with quarter wavelength coax. It's, it's quite remarkable what amateurs are going, huh, so I can use that for, I won't bore you with it. Uh, another detail, unfortunately, between the publication of the instructions and the kit that I purchased, the thing had been revised. 
And in particular, yeah, this never happens. And in particular, the use of the, the USB cable creates uh, a little bit of space for interference to arise, which is fine for Morse and voice, but it's a problem for packet radio. So there's a bunch of digital modes uh, that amateurs use that are fairly narrow compared to a Wi-Fi. And so, and the guy doing this wants to do packet. So he switched to using a pair of XPs. Now, I don't mind spending a bit of money, but I was like, really, I'm gonna buy two XPs to replace a cable? That's, that's ridiculous. I'm not gonna do it. So the original board, uh, it's easier on the green board, which is the newer board. You can see the, the rectangles with hard white edges. Those are actually transistor pairs that form H wedges for running the two motors either forward or backwards. So you have a set of four transistors to run a DC motor one way or the other. And then there's a driver chip both above and below. On the older board, uh, you can probably make out the mounting points for the, the transistors on the middle left and the driving chip. But at the bottom, what you've got is actually a USB socket or the mounting point for it. And next to it, uh, a driver chip to match serial to USB. Uh, on the right, as you can see, it's an XB. <laughs> like, uh, right, I'm sitting in hackerspace on a Saturday. <laughs> How do I fix this? I looked around, I've got a, a USB cable, um, but it's USB to TDL. And the microcontroller on the board expects 3.3. There's got to be a solution to this problem. And of course there is. Uh, I had a bag of 10K resistors. <laughs> so, so like, right, <laughs> how can I shift five volts to three volts? Well, like that. And so, and I don't, I don't need to go the other way. The board at the moment doesn't have a feedback channel. It's only commands going to it. But if I wished to go the other way, then one die of one resistor would be enough. But so for the way that I did go, which is to bring the five volts down to 3.3 before going into the, <coughs> the microcontroller, you can see the, the outline of the XP position on the board, and then a little bit of Vera board that I sort of cut off and soldered four resistors to and a, and a socket for the USB cable, and voila. I have the input, and you can see it uh, on the front of the board there. Thank you. Sort of working stuff out as I go. So that was most of it. Oh, the other problem was the metal work. I, it, it's fiddly and time consuming, and it's stuff I haven't done since high school, and frankly, I spent 20 hours on, and I just, had I understood that beforehand, I would have taken a different design, which I'll talk about in a moment. There's another problem, and it's common to rotators. The device, how am I for talking about? Ugh. Yeah, okay. Uh, the device has 360 degrees of azimuth freedom, which is great to be able to point to any one direction. But if you're wanting to follow a satellite across the sky, it might pass your zero. So, uh, whoops. So for example, assume the satellite's crossing the blue line on the left, and so your initial and the, the, your azimuth limit is vertical. So you can point here to here. So your satellite's crossing, and suddenly you hit zero degrees. So now you've got to turn the whole machine, this is the red line, the other way, and take a minute or so. And of course, the satellite's still moving. So you're out of communication for a couple of minutes, and then reconnect it before it disappears below the horizon. This is not really a satisfactory solution. The fix is you decide before the pass where you want your zero to point, and the software supports either north or south, which covers most satellites. You flick a switch on the board, you turn the thing around, you set a setting in the software, and hopefully it all works. So I'm like, that's really awful. So I'm, I'm inclined to look for a 540 degree freedom <coughs> device. They're around, and one of the options we're looking at is Satnogs. So a more contemporary, not NASA attached uh, open source project is working on a network of ground stations. In addition to running the network, they also publish far more contemporary designs. And so, apart from simple aluminum channel cut with a hacksaw, all the complicated parts are 3D printed. So there's no hours of cut and fit and fiddle and cut and fit and fiddle and cut and fit and fiddle, it's just put the bits and go. So that's, I will consider that, especially if it's easy to modify it for 540 degrees. Um, the other thing is having to have a laptop sort of on a tripod next to it is stupid. <laughs> so I use this thing called Heavens Above on my phone. Don't yet know how, but wouldn't it be nice to be able to say, I mean, I can ask, I can select a satellite. I say, well, and tell the tracker to follow it. So maybe. Um, the addition of uh, a digital compass and gyro to deal with 619 degrees of freedom. So I don't even have to worry about correctly guessing the orientation, I just plonk it and let the computer work it out. Uh, but what I really want to do is eliminate the rotator completely and instead do something called beamforming. This is a vastly more complicated approach, but 
the chips we're doing it are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So maybe. So the idea is, uh, if you take, in this case, six antennas in a straight line, this is a simple case, a phased array, and you are sending the same signal to all of them, but you send it a bit earlier to the one on the right, and then a bit later and later as you go progressively to the left, you end up with a, a coherent wavefront not going down the picture, but going to the right. That is to say, you can control the direction in which the signal is being sent, not by rotating an antenna, but by manipulating the phase relationships uh, between the signal arrival at each of the antennas. And so instead of having arrays of antennas on non-rotators, the idea is to have a bunch of non-moving antennas. Unfortunately, it's a larger number of antennas and radios, but the radios themselves are sort of incomplete radios. They're, they're front ends of radios and a lot of computation rather than complete, like 400 radios. So that it then becomes possible to, to communicate with amateur satellites, both send and receive, without having to have a moving thing in the first place. What will invalidate all of this is that, not quite invalidate it, but certainly uh, add another option, is that in January, uh, QTEL, the Qatar telco, is launching a geostationary satellite. And so far it appears that the Qatar amateur radio club will get to ride a transponder on that satellite, all the way to geostationary. And then a US satellite later next year also. So this hasn't been the case for decades. We're now back to, OK, let's put amateurs not at 500 kilometers, but at 36,000. So anyway, stuff to play with for some considerable time to come. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs>